Hi, I'm Steve Albini and I've been here at Studio La Fabrique for a week doing a seminar with a bunch of attendees from around the world. Uh, and these are some questions that have been sent in in advance. So I am going to be answering these questions now for the web content of the Mix With Masters. From Tom S. Van Aersel. Hi Steve, I was wondering how much of a producer role you take on with established bands such as Neurosis, who have a very clear vision of their music and have gained a lot of studio experience over the years. Do you still work out arrangement ideas with them, or do you take on more of a recordist and mixer role? How would this work out with a less experienced band? And do you find you can use enough of your own creativity in either way? Thank you for taking our questions. Specifically with a band like Neurosis, who have a very strong idea of their presentation, um, I, I don't have much input on things like arrangement. Um, I do have a, a kind of a technical input for s some of the recording execution. Like there may be uh, something about the arrangement where you you have a song that is very long and involves many segments and it may be uh, easier to execute if we do sections or segments separately either in the recording or mixing process. So sometimes um, either they or I would suggest doing part of the song, recording part of the song separately and assembling it with edits, um, especially on the longer songs that have big changes in moods. But um, as far as the actual arrangement is concerned, like who plays what when, um, I really have no role in that, like basically for any session. I'm, uh, I'm, not, I'm not really that good at things like that. And, and also I feel like it would be rude of me to intrude into that process for other bands. Um, I, I tend to let, other band, let the band that I'm recording work out their internal um, organization like things like arrangements and production ideas and stuff I let them figure that out and then uh, my job is basically a technical one just to record their ideas or help them execute their ideas and this would be exactly the same process with a less experienced band and uh, regarding me using enough of my own creativity I don't really think of my job as a particularly creative one um, there is an element of creativity in trying to solve certain problems. Uh, uh, you know, you may need to think in a, in a, in a non-linear fashion about how, how to do something I in the studio, but uh, I don't really want to get involved in the creative process of making the music. That's not my, that's not my job, in a sense, but also I feel like my tastes are weird enough and s specific to me that uh, if I were to impose those tastes on other bands, then they might end up making a record that for the moment made me happier but wouldn't reflect well on them in the long term or wouldn't, wouldn't be their, um, wouldn't be an expression of their creative impulse but rather an expression of mine. And I have my own band for that sort of thing. So I don't need to do that to other people. Uh, there's a PS, how is your studio cat doing? The cats are fine, we have three cats, Pip, Bacon, and Dynamite, all of them in terrific shape. Uh, they don't spend much time at the studio, they live at the house with me and my wife, but uh, they're all terrific cats. Going on to the next question. This is from Christopher Lukasik. Hello Steve, I'm a big fan of the sonic quality you're responsible for capturing and presenting to us listeners. I feel extremely close to the bands you record and mix when I play the albums. It's as if you are able to place the listener right into the sweet spot in a room and minimize the distance from the source to the listener. My question is how do you get that unmistakable palpable drum sound of yours? I know you mic top and bottom, front and back, but there is always an interesting room sort of slapback thing happening. Would you be able to comment on how you treat your room and or ambient mics and have them work with the close mics to create that effect? Many thanks for your time and dedication to sonic quality. Well, thank you. That's very nice of you, Christopher. Um, uh, when I'm recording, for example, drums in a big room, 
Uh, I often rely on the room mics to provide the, the width and the weight and the sense of depth in the recording. Um, I often find that uh, I need to use a, a delay line to delay the room mics a few milliseconds. That can be anywhere from 10 to 20 to 30 milliseconds. 30 would be an extreme case, but uh, 20 milliseconds is pretty common. If you delay the room mic slightly, you uh, allow the close mics time to speak before they are over overlapping with the ambient sounds, and then the ambient sound appears very slightly after, and it's more easily discerned that it's more easily heard as a reflection that way or as a, as a reverberation that way and not just as a, a muddiness on the original signal. So yeah, that would be, that would be probably, the only, the, probably the only specific thing I do to room mics that, that might, might give you that idea. I tend to place room mics on the floor rather than having them on stands so that they're resting on the boundary of the floor that minimizes the number of short term of short reflections going to that microphone so uh, you get a, a clearer sound from the, the clearer pickup of the sound at a distance um, pardon me let me shut off my phone okay uh, that was probably the that's probably the only specific thing I do with room mics um, is I, ha I have them on the floor generally to reduce reflections and then I will occasionally delay them by 10 to 20 milliseconds. Okay, next question is from Mikkel Shibor. Hi, I could ask you hundreds of questions, but I'll have to leave that to the next seminar, I hope, exclamation point. In the meantime, you once wrote to a band, if a record takes more than a week to make, somebody's fucking up. Do you stand by those words? And if so, how does that statement influence your decisions while recording and mixing? Many would consider that time way too short to finish a record. Do you find working with limits something inspiring, or is it just something you grew accustomed to? Yeah, I, I did start working in, a, in a, uh, an environment where no one had very much money. And as a result, most of my working methods sort of revolve around a, a fulcrum of efficiency, like trying to waste the minimum amount of time, trying to waste the minimum amount of energy, trying not to spend the minimum amount of money. So uh, a lot of my methods have to do with being able to uh, establish a basis of sound and move on with the important part and not get tied down with the minutia of the recording details. And uh, I think most records could be made in a, can be made in a week. Uh, it's hard to imagine a record that you need a lot of time for that isn't like a really elaborate production where things are being changed a lot, where the, the, the style of music changes a lot and the recording techniques change a lot. For most things where the band is going to be playing the, in the same style and with the same instruments and in the same environment, um, I think working quickly has a lot of benefits. Um, if, you, if you get the technical part out of the way quickly, then you can spend more of your energy or the band can spend more of their energy making sure that they have a take that they like. And uh, if you fix the sounds in a way that sounds good at the beginning of the process, then you don't have to spend as much time adjusting things at the end of the process because you've been making compensations along the way. You've been changing balances and um, when you print things, you print them in a kind of a finished final form regarding the sound quality and the choice of microphones and things like that. So uh, I still think working efficiently is a good idea. And I don't really know how to work any other way. Um, if I'm working on something and I get to a point where I'm satisfied with the sound, I don't think, well, what else can I do? Can I do something extra? Uh, I just accept that I'm satisfied and move on to the next thing. So um, I, 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 I don't think I can work any other way, really. Okay, 
Buddha Gedis says, Hi Steve, how was it to record both Nirvana and Page and Plant, two of the most iconic bands ever and two records with great expectations from everyone? How did you handle the pressure of having to deliver a Nirvana record that followed Nevermind and a Page and Plant record that followed, well, Led Zeppelin? Uh, second question, how do you approach stereo bus and what should one expect to get out of a stereo bus chain that one can't get from the single tracks, especially compression-wise, how to set it up, what kind of attack and release times, etc. Thanks a lot, and I hope you've had a great time, a great week at Mix for the Masters. It was a great week. It was super fun. Um, recording Nirvana and Page and Plant was basically like recording any other band. Um, in the case of Nirvana, they were a rock band from the same sort of social circle as the, the other bands that I work with. Um, they had a lot of the same experience. We shared a lot of common experiences. We knew a lot of the same people. We had played at a lot of the same clubs, that sort of thing. So it was very familiar. Um, and making that record was very straightforward. They, the band showed up. They were well rehearsed. We set their equipment up and we started recording, and, uh, like any other band. Um, the same with Page and Plant. The Page and Plant record was a little bit different because it was a more protracted process. And um, things about the setup of the band would change from song to song. Jimmy Page was using quite a different guitar setup for every song, uh, different amplifiers, different guitars. Um, so that that w took a little bit of compensation from a, on a song by song basis. There were also uh, quite a few more um, secondary things to consider with the Page and Plant record. There was or there were orchestral overdubs. There were a couple of guest musicians, um, things of that nature. But basically, the the process that I go through with those records was the same as the process that I go through with basically any record. Um, Regarding the stereo bus, uh, for me, I don't, I don't do any processing to the stereo bus as a matter of routine. Once in a while, I'll put a stereo equalizer on the stereo bus, but most of the time the stereo bus is just the individual tracks being balanced using the pan pots and into a final stereo image, and that's what gets recorded on the half-inch stereo master. Um, I don't use stereo bus compression. Uh, I, I have tried it a couple of times and I've just never preferred the sound uh, of the music running through the compressor. I've just always preferred the natural sound of the music. So uh, I don't use a stereo bus compressor uh, and I don't use any stereo bus processing as a, as a normal thing. I, I don't, it doesn't even occur to me. It doesn't cross my mind. So. Fabio Yafisco says, hi Steve, what was the cheapest piece of gear you used for recording and mixing? Second question, I used some old Shure mixer type M67 and SE30 mod. What do you think about them for a preamp? Well, the first studio setup that I had was an eight track session, an eight, tra eight track setup in the basement of my house. And the, the mixer was a small Soundcraft um, 300 series mixer, uh, but that's not the cheapest piece of gear I've used. There was a, um, a market, an open market in Chicago called the Maxwell Street Market, and there was some secondhand recording equipment that appeared on one of the tables there. Uh, there was an Altec equalizer. It was a passive equalizer with uh, big rotary potentiometers, and that equalizer cost me ten dollars and I have used that equalizer so there's that. Um, I have also, well on the session today for example, um, one of the microphones I used on the guitar was a very inexpensive Audio-Technica microphone called the Pro 37. Um, those microphones were you know routinely available for a hundred dollars or less and they're a perfectly usable studio quality condenser microphone. So uh, I, I have no objection to cheap or inexpensive stuff. I, I use consumer grade equipment sometimes. I use, you know, half million dollar consoles sometimes. Uh, it, it depends on the circumstances and what I, what I need to do. There, there's no reason that you can't use entirely very cheap stuff. The 
quality of recording equipment that you can get just at a guitar store now far, far surpasses what was available when I first started. So it's possible to do decent recording with microphones that you bought at the guitar store for a few hundred dollars, absolutely no problem. Regarding the M67 SE30 mod, I have no idea what that is. I don't know what those are, and I, I don't have an opinion. I'm sure if, if you listen to them and you think they sound good, well, then they are good. So uh, if you are using them and getting good results, then carry on. Okay. Paolo Nowhere Man. I wonder if that's his real name, Paolo Nowhere Man. Uh, says, hi Steve, I wanted to know if you choose the recording facility and the gear depending on the music and band you're working with. If not, what's the best approach to capture the true nature of a band? Thanks for your answer. If the choice is up to me for the recording facility, then yes, I will choose a recording facility that I think is most suited to that type of music. These days, most of the recording that I do is at Electrical Audio. We have two studios there, and both studios are pretty comprehensive. Like some, you know, it's hard, it's hard to think of one kind of music that would be better in one or the other. So um, a lot of that is determined by the budget or the schedule that the band wants to use. If they want to use a very condensed, very short schedule, uh, <coughs> if the budget allows it, I would do those sessions in Studio A because everything is on the same floor in Studio A. It's a little bit faster to get from thing to thing. If the budget was quite low and that was the primary consideration, then I would choose Studio B because Studio B is less expensive. Um, the best way to capture the true nature of a band is to do as little interfering as possible with their internal processes. So if they're having a discussion about how they think a song should go, let them finish their discussion. If they have certain quirks or particularities about the way they play, let them indulge those quirks. Let them do things in the way that's unique and specific to them. That would be the, my, my favorite, my best advice there. Ricardo Passini says, uh, Hi, Mr. Albini, I'm really excited to ask you some questions. You teach me so much with your records and encourage me with your passion. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Mr. Passini. First question. Uh, you said you use uh, 20 millisecond in drum ambience. Do you use the same trick on guitars, bass, and vocals, ambient mic? Uh, I have used delay on all of those things. I don't do it religiously, but sometimes you can get uh, more clarity from the close mic signal. If there is a bit of delay on the ambient mic, it keeps the ambient mic from overlapping with the sound quite so much. Um, so yeah, you, you can get a little bit of extra clarity if you use the delay for on the room mics for you know, guitars, bass, and vocals. Second, while I was recording guitars in a big studio, I had the opportunity to use a Coles 4038 in front of a really loud guitar cabinet. It doesn't work. Too distorted. What is your approach? You tend to lower the volume or move the mic? Usually, which is your favorite distance for mic and cab, both guitar and bass? Uh, well, if your Coles 4038 was distorting in front of your guitar cabinet, then it was probably too close to the cabinet. Um, and it may also just be that that's an inappropriate mic to use on that guitar. Um, I tend to have the microphones fairly far away from the cabinet, um, 14 to 18 inches, something like that. Um, I would not change the sound of the amplifier to suit the microphone. Like if the guy is playing guitar at his normal performance volume and he's happy with the volume, then I wouldn't lower the volume just for the sake of the microphone. Uh, I would, in that case, I would use a different microphone. I would just pick something else. Uh, for bass guitar, I tend to have the microphones very close to the speaker, and that's because I'm using directional mics, and that exaggerates the proximity effect, which um, increases the low frequency response of the microphone. It extends it and increases the low, low frequency response. And for a close up recording on, I mean, for a bass, electric bass guitar cabinet, um, I find getting enough low end recorded is sometimes a problem, so I prefer to use the the frequency response of the microphone to boost the low end rather than using an equalizer on the console. Third, said that you usually avoid compression while tracking. 
How is your approach for mixing? Do you prefer to compress single channels or use bus compression? Um, I don't use as much compression on sounds as a lot of other engineers. Um, about the only thing that I routinely use compression on is the lead vocal, and that's because the dynamic range of a vocal can sometimes be wider than that of the whole band. Um, and I'll often use a peak limiter on the bass drum to even out the low frequency response. But even then, the bass, th that's normally only on one of the two microphones on the bass drum. The batter side microphone, I won't use a limiter on. Um, and the same with the bass guitar. I'll sometimes use a, li a, a limiter or compressor on the bassier of the two microphones that's on the bass guitar cabinet. And that's to keep the low frequencies in the, in the mix uh, or in the balance of the band, keep the low frequencies at a sort of an even level. Uh, I'll typically have two microphones on the cabinet, a brighter mic and a darker mic and I'll have a compressor on the darker mic only. Other than that, I don't tend to do a lot of compression. And come mix down, I don't use bus compression. Um, I might put a, something like a limiter on the snare drum or on the overheads or something like that to control the level, the peak level of the snare drum and the overheads or on the channel. But that might, that sound, that might be about it. It's really rare for me to use a compressor as a to solve a problem. Okay, Elad Berliner says, uh, uh, hello, Mr. Albini. I really wanted to attend this seminar. Hope you'll do it again. The hardest thing for me in mixing is the vocal level. When listening the next day, it's usually too loud or not loud enough. What is your approach and how do you find the right volume? Well, uh, I start by getting a balance of the music together. Uh, and then very quickly after I've gotten a basic balance of the music together, I'll open the lead vocal and I'll often have it in a position where I, that I think is too high. The reason that I do that is I want to hear if there, is, if there are any points where the, the vocal dips down in level and might become obscured by the music. I want to be aware of those. So I typically start with the mix, ba mix balance with the vocal in a position where I know that it is obviously too high, but I can use that to adjust, uh, to calibrate my expectations for what the vocal is going to sound like when it's deeper in the music. So then I'll bring the level down s fractionally and just experimentally over the course of several cycles, I'll bring the vocal down from a point where it was obviously too high to a point where I think it sounds natural. Um, and then I'll typically stop. Um, I'll often have my finger on the lead vocal master fader while I'm mixing. And as lines come up that I remember uh, from my sense memory of the vocal performance, that I remember these lines being too quiet, then I'll just ghost those few lines or few syllables up using the vocal master fader. And I'll often do that over the course of a song. I'll do that many times so that a particular line or a particular world word, if it starts trailing off and I notice it's trailing off, I'll feather the volume up slightly so that it maintains a presence within the music. Um, I often use uh, parallel compression on vocals. That is, there'll be a one channel of the vocal as recorded and then another channel on the desk of that vocal compressed fairly heavily. And I'll bring that channel up just until it starts to support the, the quieter moments of the lead vocal. I don't really want to raise the noise floor a lot and I, I don't want the whole of the vocal to have a compressed sound. Um, but that allows me to add more of the vocal at low, low levels uh, than I have to than would be there automatically just with the single channel. Um, and that and balancing against those two can normally normalize the vocal level to the point where you can hear it in the loud parts and you can hear it in the quiet parts. Pat Stevens says, Hi Steve, I read that you usually go for 500 nanoweber alignment uh, at 15 IPS on ATR tape. When doing so, considering this is a pretty hot alignment, what kind of levels are you aiming at when you are tracking? Zero VO maximum on vocals, bass guitars, more. What about the instruments that have more transients, kick drum and snare? Uh, yeah, I do use 500 nanoweber uh, per meter alignment on the ATR, and I do consider that a pretty hot level, so I tend to be fairly conservative with level. I normally use peak meters when I'm looking at the tape machine. The PPM meters give me a pretty good idea of what the transient signal level is going to the tape machine. 
and I tend to keep those out of the red, so I'm not, I know that I'm in no danger of clipping the input of the tape machine or clipping the channel. Um, for signals with more steady state, um, like bass or electric guitar or uh, vocals, things like that, uh, I tend not to peak the signal um, higher than zero VU. Um, that, so I would say, yeah, zero VU is basically a maximum for all those signals that are being measured using the VU meters. Um, for everything else, I just try to keep the peak meter uh, within the normal excursion so that the peak, so that the signal doesn't go beyond the, the um, indicator for the PPM meter. Thank you. Uh, so that was the last question. Uh, thanks for those questions. Those were interesting. It was fun to answer them. Um, I'm happy to help. Uh, if anybody has any questions, I'm sure you can track me down on the web. I'm pretty easy to find and I'd be happy to answer your questions, either in a forum someplace or by email. So, thanks for listening. Hey!